Hello, I'm Kevin Fernando, a GP working near Edinburgh in Scotland and content advisor for Medscape Global and UK. Welcome to our podcast, Medical Mentor, a bite-sized regular chat for all of us working in primary care. Podcasts will cover hot topics, practice pearls and hacks, as well as pitfalls to avoid, helping make our lives a little bit easier in primary care, but ultimately to help improve the lives of our patients. In this podcast, I'm going to talk about the renaming of NAFLD, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, to MASLD, metabolic dysfunction associated steatotic liver disease, and how we might identify and manage people with MASLD in primary care. I hope to convince you about the gravity of a diagnosis of MASLD, the need to identify individuals at high risk of progressive liver disease, and appropriate interventions to prevent the debilitating consequences of advanced liver disease. Now, during summer 2023, NAFLD was renamed by international consensus to reduce the stigma associated with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and also to facilitate a shift towards prevention, proactive case finding, and early identification of progressive liver fibrosis. So, how do we define MASLD? Well, MASLD encompasses individuals with evidence of hepatic steatosis, for example, found incidentally on an abdominal ultrasound scan, and at least one cardiometabolic risk factor. These include a BMI, body mass index of over 25, or indeed 23 from a high risk ethnic group such as South Asians, or a waist circumference over 94 centimetres in men, or again over 90 centimetres if that man is from a high-risk ethnic group, or in females, a waist circumference over 80 centimetres in all ethnicities. Additionally, another cardiometabolic risk factor is an HbA1c between 42 and 47 millimoles per mole, or 6 and 6.4%, or anyone with established type 2 diabetes. Blood pressure, greater or equal to 130 over 85 millimeters of mercury, or anyone on established antihypertensive drug treatment. We also need to look at dyslipidemia as cardiometabolic risk factors. So plasma triglyceride levels, greater or equal to 1.7 millimoles per liter, or established lipid lowering treatment, or a plasma HDL cholesterol level, of less than 1.0 millimoles per liter, or again, established lipid lowering treatment. So all the standard cardiometabolic risk factors. So you can see then, MASLD is primarily a metabolic disease. It's the liver's manifestation of the metabolic syndrome. Furthermore, MASH, metabolic dysfunction associated steatohepatitis, replaces NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Now, MASH is the more inflammatory stage of MASLD defined by inflammation of hepatocytes. And this stage is significant because MASH carries a risk of progression to fibrosis, cirrhosis, and even hepatocellular carcinoma. So how common is MASLD? Well, since the 1970s, mortality has fallen from vascular disease, from respiratory disease, even cancer whereas mortality has risen fourfold from liver disease. And the main causes of liver disease over those years are, of course, alcohol misuse, chronic viral hepatitis, and now MASLD and MASH, driven by the obesity pandemic. So MASLD is actually now the most common liver disorder in Western countries, affecting up to a third of adults globally. And up to 90% of people living with obesity or type 2 diabetes. Sadly, MASLD or MASH, I should say, is the fastest growing indication for liver transplantation in Western countries. So what we need to do in primary care is to prevent the progression of MASLD to the more inflammatory stage of MASH. MASLD is also associated with an increased prevalence and incidence of cardiovascular disease and is a risk factor for hepatocellular carcinoma. 
cardiovascular disease is actually a more common cause of death than liver disease in people living with mazeld. So again, in primary care, if we can detect mazeld early, lifestyle change and certain clinical interventions may slow or even stop progression of liver disease. So how do we diagnose mazeld in primary care? Well, as I briefly mentioned, we need evidence of steatotic liver disease on an abdominal ultrasound scan and at least one cardiometabolic risk factor from the list I outlined earlier. But we do need to exclude any secondary causes of steatotic liver disease. For example, drug-induced liver disease. Some of the drugs we commonly prescribed in primary care can actually cause steatotic liver disease. For example, amiodarone, steroids, methotrexate, and tamoxifen. Certain endocrine disorders can also cause steatotic liver disease, hypothyroidism, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and growth hormone deficiency. There are some nutritional causes too, rapid weight loss, malnutrition, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and finally, chronic hepatitis C infection can also cause steatotic liver disease. So we do need to exclude these secondary causes. And finally, we need to exclude excessive daily alcohol consumption. If men are drinking over 3.75 units daily of alcohol and women over 2.5 units daily, they're actually in a separate new category called MET-ALD, metabolic alcoholic liver disease. Now that's a combined etiology, both uh, evidence of mazeld and also alcohol-related liver disease. If there's no evidence of excess daily alcohol consumption, then we establish a diagnosis of mazeld. Now, a big change in practice for me as a GP is to consider screening all my patients with steatosis, for example, incidentally found on an abdominal ultrasound, for features of metabolic syndrome, independent of their liver blood test. Now, to be honest, previously, if I saw an abdominal ultrasound report with evidence of hepatic steatosis, I would offer some cursory weight management advice and then file the result as completed in the notes. But now I'm actively screening for features of the metabolic syndrome due to the metabolic associations of mazeld. Additionally, to assess the risk of advanced liver fibrosis of people with mazeld, I'm now regularly using non-invasive scoring systems such as the Fibrosis 4 score or FIB4 score. This looks at my patient's age, AST and ALT levels, and platelet count, and calculates the likelihood of that individual developing fibrotic liver disease. Those at increased risk of fibrotic liver disease should be considered for second-line non-invasive testing, such as liver elastography, for example, a fibroscan, or even a liver biopsy in high-risk situations. Finally, management of mazeld in primary care. What can we do in primary care for people with mazeld to lower their risk of advanced fibrosis? Well, as I mentioned already, lifestyle intervention is pivotal. Mazeld, as I've said a number of times now, is in essence a metabolic condition. We need to strongly encourage and facilitate weight loss where possible. Evidence suggests Weight loss of 3 to 5% reduces hepatic steatosis. Weight loss of 5 to 7% can lead to resolution of MASH. And weight loss of over 10% can actually improve hepatic fibrosis. Uh, these can be powerful figures to share with our patients with mazeld to empower them to facilitate change. The EASL, the European Association for the Study of the Liver, actually recommends a Mediterranean diet, which can reduce liver fat even in the absence of weight loss. We should also counsel our patients with mazeld about uh, aiming for adequate amounts of moderate intensity exercise, exercise that leaves them sweaty and short of breath. Also, ideally, alcohol abstinence is advised, uh, but we have to be realistic. We should certainly counsel patients to drink within recommended limits of alcohol. We also need to actively manage any coexisting features of the metabolic syndrome. So any coexisting dysglycemia, prediabetes, or indeed established type 2 diabetes, any associated hypertension, dyslipidemia, and abdominal obesity. 
We also need to assess cardiovascular risk in people living with mazeld. Remember, I told you the leading cause of death in people with mazeld is not their liver disease. It's actually a cardiovascular event. So assess cardiovascular risk. If it is elevated, do consider statin therapy. Now, there's no reason not to start a statin in people with mazeld unless their liver blood tests are three times the upper limit of normal, in which case that individual does need further investigations. So do uh, consider mitigating their future cardiovascular risk. And finally, interestingly, coffee might help. There's been evidence brewing for many years now that coffee might help regress some of the changes associated with mazeld. Now, there's no specific recommendations. However, it's thought a moderate intake of three to five cups of coffee daily may well be beneficial. What about pharmacological treatments for mazeld or MASH? Importantly, there are no current licensed drug therapies for mazeld or MASH. However, there is emerging evidence for SGLT2 inhibitors, GLP-1 receptor agonists, which remain in worldwide shortage, and also the dual GLP GIP agonist tazepatide. Interestingly, American Diabetes Association and European Association for the Study of Diabetes Guidance and also EASL guidance suggest that pioglitazone, one of the older diabetes medications, can be used off-label in those with MASH, even without type 2 diabetes. So to conclude, mazeld is primarily a metabolic disease. It's the liver's manifestation of the metabolic syndrome. We need to risk stratify all our patients with suspected mazeld or MASH using non-invasive testing. For example, initially the FIB4 score to assess their risk of advanced liver fibrosis and perhaps second line uh, non-invasive testing in the form of liver elastography. And we need to emphasize the importance of lifestyle interventions, ideally aiming for a weight reduction of 10%, which might improve hepatic fibrosis. So thank you all for listening. I hope you found this podcast helpful. Please do listen to our future Medical Mentor podcast, which will be available on all major platforms. Follow me on X, formerly Twitter, at Dr. Kevin Fernando, or email me on kfernando at webmd.net if you have any questions, comments, or ideas for future podcasts. Thank you again for listening.